So I want to encourage you, first of all, that there are colleges that are earnestly seeking homeschooled students, and they are really anxious to get your students on campus. So one, that's... Welcome everyone to our uh, another one of our senior webinars and this one is very special because we have a very special guest with us Kimberly Farley from CLT and she is our homeschool what our homeschool partnership specialist right and one of our homeschool moms so if you will in the chat go ahead and put where you are that helps us if you are, um, you know, mostly Tennessee, other states, other countries um, will know that. So go ahead and start putting where you are in the chat. Let's see, we got 65. We got everyone jumping on here. I am Lonnie Carey. I've been with Home Life Academy for many years. Don't even want to count them anymore. As a senior counselor, um, the solutions specialist kind of anything out of the box is going to come to me and um, so we wanted to do this very special presentation because this is the time right now for college applications uh, standardized testing everything happens in the fall of the senior year so we are going to have some really wonderful information and um, if you have questions, go ahead and as Kimberly's doing her presentation, go ahead and put those questions in the q and I will be monitoring that, answering those. Oh, we got people from all over the place, mainly Tennessee so far. Africa, I saw. South Africa? Oh my. And um, so, and then we'll, at the end, we'll have the Q&A section and Kimberly can jump in for some of those. So um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of people on already. So without any further, um, you know, and like I said, if you have questions, just go ahead and put it in the chat, put it in the Q&A for us. But I am going to let Kimberly go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Lonnie. I am Kimberly Farley. I am a former home life mom. My youngest just graduated this past year. So we graduated all three of our kids through Home Life Academy as after homeschooling them for many years. And they have all successfully launched to, um, in their choices, faith-based private liberal arts schools on some pretty significant merit scholarships. And so I've been through this process of getting kids through high school uh, in homeschool and then moving on to college. And I gained a lot of information just walking through it multiple times with different students, with different personalities and different strengths. And then now I am the director of homeschool partnerships for classic learning test. In that role, not only do I work with a lot of great homeschool partners like Home Life Academy, but I also work with a lot of college admissions professionals. So I want to encourage you, first of all, that there are colleges that are earnestly seeking homeschooled students, and they are really anxious to get your students on campus. So one, that's, that's great. I love to hear that. I personally think homeschoolers just thrive and, you know, and I'm glad that colleges are recognizing that more and more and they are truly seeking to recruit homeschooled students. But we want students to be able to put their best foot forward. I know for me, uh, we were a single income family for many, many years that did not allow for a huge savings account for every student before they went off to college. Merit scholarships became the main goal because that's how they were gonna be able to attend their colleges of choice. So I would encourage you, it is possible. There is a lot of stuff out there. And so I wanna give you some overview today of things that are helpful all through high school, not just your senior year, but like freshman year through, uh, through senior year, things that you can do to set your students up for success as they are seeking a college education. So with that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And I do have a PowerPoint here for you. So we have titled this Keep It Classy, High School Decisions That Matter for College. So today we will be going over the main points of academics, extracurriculars, standardized testing, social media, and then a timeline. 
So all of this stuff, I want to just say, first of all, this is not a huge to-do list, okay? Do not approach this as these are all of the extra things that I now have to do. Well, I wanna give you some general principles that you can be thinking about and weaving in throughout your students' high school years. And some of this will apply more to you than others. Some of this is just mistakes that I made along the way that I want you all to avoid or things that I hear from admissions professionals at college are some of the stumbling blocks that a lot of people are encountering. And so hopefully we can help you to have a, a smoother experience as you get to this point with your students. And if there are students watching, I'm really excited. I have a few messages that are tailored specifically to them, but you know, great information for both students and parents. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about academic preparation. Um, there are always people I see on a lot of homeschool groups, questions like what worked for your student? How did they score on this particular test? What math program did you use? Well, that's a really broad question. And there are always people, and I've probably been guilty of this myself, this is what you must use. It's absolutely fabulous, right? This, this really worked for my family. But you have to find what works for your family. There is no one magic thing that is going to work for everyone. At least in my family, even my different kids sometimes did different curriculum because they were different styles of learning. And so we changed it up sometimes from one kid to the next because what worked really well for one didn't work for the next. And I was so thankful for the, uh, the independence that homeschooling gave us that we could tailor their education to each student specifically. So just keep that in mind. There is no like one magic thing that you must do in order to have your students well prepared. And your home life counselors are a great source of information. I know in all my years as a home life mom, I have had many conversations with counselors over what do I do with this? <laughs> so make sure that you are reaching out to them. They are a tremendous resource and knowledge base. So in general though, as you were thinking about academics, be familiar with what most colleges require. So home life has now transitioned to where they have like this four-year college track as one of the options that you can select in Apple Corps. And that will, that will give you a really good list of generally what are most colleges seeking as far as academics. So always, always keep that in mind. However, there are colleges that have different requirements or additional requirements, and you need to be reaching out to colleges specifically as you get to that point where the, the college list is starting to narrow down a little bit. For instance, having two years of a foreign language is a common requirement among many colleges. One of the colleges my youngest son applied to required three years of the same foreign language. So we had to know that early enough to actually work in a third year of foreign language. So make sure that you are covering all of your bases. That's really important. That's where digging in and doing some research comes, uh, comes into play. And then when it comes to electives, I just wanna encourage you, this is where we as homeschoolers get to be super creative, right? Find those things that your student is really passionate about and interested in. Those can become uh, electives that can be really fun and nurturing to them. They can make them stand out a little bit on an application too, because they have this really kind of off the wall thing uh, on their transcript. For instance, my oldest son is total history buff. And when we first moved to Tennessee, he read everything he could get his hands on about the Civil War. And we toured all these Civil War battlefields. And, you know, we had to do all of this neat stuff because we were right here living among the history. And so for him, he had an elective that was just Civil War history because he spent so many hours researching Civil War history and visiting battlefields and talking to us about that and, you know, and writing out um, all kinds of information about troop movements and, you know, whatever, whatever just made his heart happy as he researched that topic in depth. So that's not something that typically comes up on a list, but for him, it was just the ticket. The other thing that you can do is, um, Something like genealogy, if you have a student that's really interested in genealogy, that's a great thing to pursue and can be an elective on your transcript. Other things, professional certifications. So my youngest son is a computer science guy. 
And he did some courses that he could take actually for free that, you know, they're usually at professional development kind of things. He was able to work through all of those. Those are things that you can take certification exams for. That not only can stand out on his transcript as an elective where he pursued, you know, this kind of narrower interest within computer science, but it also then becomes a way for him to earn some extra money because, you know, he has a certification that is very desirable within the computer science world. I actually know a student who is serving as a volunteer EMT with the volunteer firefighters in her community because she got her EMT certification. So she really wants to do something medical and she was able to do that. So think creatively, think a little outside the box when it comes to electives. And a lot of times this is where I think homeschoolers have an advantage that, that students in schools will never have. The other thing that I want to say about academic preparation is as you are working through various things with your students in the beginning years, you know, late middle school, early high school, you may give them a lot of specific assignments. You know, today I want you to get this, you know, these pages done. I want you to answer these questions. As you work toward the, the end of high school, I would encourage you to turn over more and more independence and planning and autonomy to them. That doesn't mean that you don't give deadlines. But what it means is you start giving them more responsibility for planning how they're going to get something done within a two week time period or a one month time period. And that really helped my students like by the end of high school, I did not give them anything specific. I just said, I want this done by this date or, you know, you must turn in a science unit every two weeks, how you divide up your time. I don't care. And as long as they could do that, it really helped them as they went to college because college doesn't require, like for the most part, they're not gonna require turn this in this day and this in this day and this in this day in order to get to this big project. They're gonna tell them on the syllabus, your project is due this day and it's up to them to decide how to do it. So build in as you are homeschooling the independence and the autonomy to figure out how to break these things up into smaller sections. And it can be very, very beneficial as they go off to college. Then finally, consider courses outside your home. So this may be co-ops or tutorials. It could be an online class. We're gonna talk a little bit more about dual enrollment and stuff later, but the outside classes for my students, we did most things in house. We just did them you know, here, that was, that was how I preferred to approach things. But we did a couple of classes outside the home. One, when they needed academic letters of reference, they had a really good source of those. And it wasn't me contacting a college saying, hey, I've been their only English teacher or math teacher or whatever, can I write the academic recommendation letter? That may be a possibility. But if you have a great resource where they've already done a class outside the home, then you do have a source for that. Additionally, it is someone else that maybe has a different style of teaching, has a different style of uh, requiring things or, you know, or how they approach or even how they grade may be different. And that can be really helpful for students before they get to college to have that experience where they have to adapt to different teachers. So I, I'm not a huge proponent of like, oh, you should outsource all this stuff, but certainly can be a good plan if you can work it to do one or two classes outside the home. So let's talk grades. Um, grades are a big deal and I wish they weren't such a big deal because we want our kids to learn. We want them to know the material that grades should not be the end goal. Unfortunately, it's just the way we work right now. This is the way admissions is working. This is the way college is working. And so it's a fact of life that we just kind of have to adapt to. They are important for admissions and scholarship. And you should make sure that your students understand that going in, that this is an important thing that, you know, how they perform is going to affect their choices later on. And sometimes that's hard for a 14 year old to, to fully grasp that, you know, whether I'm slacking off now, it can affect, you know, and maybe I care more about it four years from now than I do right now, but, um, just, just know that it is a concern. But I think one of the really important things is that students know how their grade will be calculated. I really like to kind of think about, am I preparing them for all of life and for the next stage of academics? 
And so I would sell the kids early on. Let's say it was a science class. 65% of your grade will be determined by your test scores and 35% of your grade will be determined by your lab reports. We did things different ways, depending on what curriculum we were using or what, you know, what projects we had them do. You know, if it was more of a project-based class or a discussion-based class, uh, we had, you know, different, different ways that we were going to do that. But we set that out at the beginning of the semester or the year, and we communicated that to our kids, just like a college professor will do with their syllabus. Here are your assignments. Here's how it will factor into your grade. That also provides accountability for you. And it gives, it sets the expectation for them. So they're not surprised at the end of the year. Then make sure that you're setting reasonable deadlines and expectations and hold to those. This is really important because when your student gets to college, the professor is probably not going to care if they're having a bad day or they didn't get something done on time. They need to turn it in. It needs to be done when the deadline is. So this is really hard in homeschooling sometimes because we have a lot more flexibility. We personally schooled year round deadlines. You know, it, it looked a little different for us. So I still wanted certain things done in certain time frames, and I communicated that clearly to the students. Now, that doesn't mean that if we were sick or if we had family visiting or if we were having a family emergency, we didn't say, okay, wait a minute, that deadline that I set, we're going to push that aside because, you know, mama and papa are visiting right now. And so we're going to take the week off and spend time with them. And so we're going to push everything back one week, you know, and we have the flexibility to do that. But again, communicate clearly to the students and don't let them just kind of slide on deadlines because that's not a great way to set them up for success going forward. Then Consider how college courses will grade and practice that early. So there's this very real thing happening right now in schools where there is tremendous grade inflation. And I think all of us know that, that, you know, what was an A 20 years ago is uh, not the same standard as what it is now. And admissions professionals know that as well. I can guarantee you they are talking about it. And but what I had in mind with my students was, I don't care what's happening in other places. I'm preparing you for life and I'm preparing you for future academic endeavors. And so I'm gonna consider that. We personally taught to mastery. If they took a test and they did not do well on it, they had to go back and correct all that and figure out where they went wrong and, you know, and, and redo the work. I did not necessarily give them an opportunity to retest or to improve their grade. I might hold them accountable to the grade that they earned on the test because that's what a college class was going to do. But I still taught to mastery. And so there are, there are different pieces of that. Now, there are still some extra credit offered in college classes from time to time, depending on the professor, <laughs> very much determines, you know, is determined by the professor. But just Think about that because the one thing that I've seen that is really shocking sometimes to homeschooled students is deadlines are deadlines. They, they must stick to them. And they were surprised that they didn't have an opportunity to go back and correct and, and resubmit things for a better grade. By the way, that's shocking to public school students as well that are often practicing that in high schools right now. But just keep that in mind, like make sure that and maybe it looks different in your freshman year than it does in your students' junior and senior years, but be working toward preparing them for those expectations. Oh, can I jump in for a second, Kimberly? Yes, ma'am. When we're talking about this, you know, because it all sounds very structured, and in a way it is very structured, but, um, you know, some of the things that the college professors have um, have told us as well is the whole thing about deadlines, and um, you know usually that's the only drawback as far as the homeschool students is that they do not take those seriously. But you know a lot of homeschool moms have this philosophy of, oh well, we just do homeschooling year round, you know, which is great because they are learning year round. However, uh, they say, and we did this. Um, that's not life, you know, just to have everything just, you know, just going along even the whole time. Um, you know, that's not what college is all about. So what we did is um, we did push for those deadlines before a break, 
And they say, this is very, very important, you know, so you can do this in your homeschool, like before Christmas break, before a fall break, a spring break, a summer break, you know, you are going to have these deadlines just like they're going to have in college and it is going to be due and, you know, no excuses, um, none of that, you know, because it's easy when you're the mom for them to say, oh, well, mom, you know, I didn't have time. And I would just say, well, you know, tell that to your college professor, you know, um, so they'd be like, yeah, they don't care. No, 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 they do not care, you know, and I don't care. You do whatever it takes. So, you know, my boys were up at sometimes five, six in the morning doing all their work to make sure that they were going to meet that mom deadline. It's just as serious. So you get them, you know, you put the pressure on. It's OK. Um, put that pressure on and then they're going to have a break. That is life, you know, and that way they're not going to be overwhelmed if everything hits at once, you know. So I think that's, you know, I always tell moms that when they're like, oh, we just do it a little bit all year. I'm like, yeah, that's great. But, you know, have those deadlines, have those times of high pressure on your kids. It's not going to kill them. It's good for them. And then let them have a break. <laughs> Yeah, we, we absolutely schooled year round. I mean, that was just the way that our family worked best to do it. But even within that, I built in some very specific deadlines of this is the day you will take the test and whether or not you're prepared, you're going to take the test and that's the grade you're going to get. And um, at the time, everybody was like, nobody else homeschools this way. Why are you doing this to us? And now that they are on the other side, you know, one has graduated from college two are in college. They're like, thank you. Like this is, you know, we, they came in better prepared to handle time management crises than some of their peers did because we did hold fast to that. They were like, oh yeah, mom meant business when she said this is the deadline. So and, it, it is really helpful for their preparation. And the other thing I really liked that you touched on was that college professors are not going to micromanage you. They are going to give you a syllabus at the beginning and expect that you are going to follow that. And sometimes homeschoolers do not get that. So I suggest letting your, you know, especially by the time they're 10th and 11th grade, um, let them be totally independent. My kids were totally independent. I would give them assignments. And then really, I would say, have you done all your work? You know, if they wanted to do something, well, of course, I wouldn't even know when they did it, but they did it. You know, so do not be sitting there next to your high school or making sure they've got their work done. That's for elementary kids. But high schoolers should be just really totally independent to know what their assignments are and they're going to do it. And then you're going to grade it and you're going to have discussions and you're going to, you know, it depends on the course, but you're not going to be micromanaging. You're not going to be sitting there with them to make sure they've got their work done. Yeah, absolutely. And it really does set them up for success later on if we take that approach. Let's talk briefly about dual credit. Um, dual credit is when college courses are taken during high school and they earn both high school and college credit at the same time. So this can be very desirable. Um, few things that are benefits of it. It's often online or in-person options if you have a, a college or a community college close to you. It may be really affordable depending on the state that you're in and the programs that exist. A lot of times there is funding for this. Even if you're not doing that, if you wanna take an online course with a private school, those courses I have found are often the same price or sometimes less than an outside course that you would take through a homeschool organization that's doing online classes. So a lot of times what we paid for maybe one outside high school class, it was the same price that I paid for a dual enrollment course with a PhD college professor teaching it. So um, make sure that, you know, that there are some great options out there for that. It's a great way to try out different colleges. For instance, my youngest son did classes with the, the college that he's at now. And he found like he, those were taught by the professors who are on campus that were teaching their on-campus classes. That can be different depending on uh, which college is offering the dual enrollment. But for him, it was a great way to see what the expectations were, what the rigor was like, and the types of professors and their availability and their style. And so for him, it was a great way to really confirm that that was his first choice. 
And there are a wide range of options. Everything from which school to go to the, the schedule. You know, some of them do compressed schedules. Some are full on semester schedules. Um, and just the type of school and the type of courses, there is so, just so much out there that you can choose from. But we need to think about some things before we say, oh yeah, we're all in on dual enrollment. So the first question is, is your student ready? Okay, this is a really big question because the grades are not going away. Mom didn't assign these grades and the grades are sticking with your student. So make sure that your student is ready academically for the amount of work that is gonna be required. So remember that these are the equivalent of a full year given during a semester. So it's a compressed work space. You know, they have, they have a compressed timeline. Uh, what you cover in a year in math, they're covering in one semester. So think about that. And is your student ready for that level of work and that pace of work? Is your student ready to do the writing and the academic rigor that is required? Do they know how to cite sources? You know, are there some things that you've done in preparation to make sure that they can jump into that level of class? So those are some of the academic considerations. I'm sure the home life counselors have a lot more guidance that they can give you on that end. But the other thing that I really want to address is that socially, your student needs to be ready to interact with college students. They will be either going in person to a college where they will be sitting in there with people of all ages. These are not just minors. These are going to be 18 to maybe 40, 50 year olds that are sitting in that class. And so are they ready to interact and to deal with the topics that come up among those students? If they are taking online classes, every online class that my students took required them to do a forum post all the time. Like I think every class that they did, even in the math classes and things, they had to do these forum posts. There was a live interaction with other students that were both on campus and those who were online. And so topics came up that, maybe more mature. So be thinking about that. Is your student ready to interact on that level? Then the, the next consideration that I really want you to think about is, is your student ready to communicate and advocate for themselves? This is a college class taught by a college professor. They do not want to talk to parents. So if your student is not ready to handle all of their own communication, you need to do some other things before you start dual enrollment. I hear from college professors, they are really tired of trying to deal with parents whose students should be contacting them instead. And so make sure that your students are ready to handle the communication and the advocacy that they need to do. This means that they can respond to different uh, requirements deadlines, that they can manage that, all of that piece of it, and that if they're going to miss a class, that they will think ahead to email their professor and say, I'm going to miss this class today. This is why, you know, what can I do? Those kinds of things they need to be thinking about and doing independently before you commit to dual enrollment. That doesn't mean that we as parents don't say to them, did you talk to your professor? <laughs> did you communicate this. Let me read that email before you send it. But they should not be relying on you to reach out to their professor if they are having an issue. You, the student needs to do that themselves if they are taking a college class. Um, then secondly, you really need to think about this content and worldview when you are considering both which college you're going to send your students to, as well as which class selection within that college. So we personally did a lot of faith-based homeschooling. You know, we, part of the reason that we chose homeschooling was we wanted to really focus on our faith and teach from that perspective. But that's not necessarily true by the time they're going to college, if they're going to a secular college, specifically a community college. I had my daughter do some classes at the community college that I thought would be like pretty safe, you know, like oh, well, these will not have a lot of worldview in them, right? This is, she was going as a junior or senior, I can't remember which. And I thought, okay, well, she really wants to go to a Christian college and we're gonna save the literature and the philosophy and the history courses for the, for the Christian college because we knew what kind of content they would have there and that you know they would be pointing back to truth all the time. But for, our, for her, 
we were like, well, let's do a math class and a foreign language class, dual enrollment. The amount of worldview and the stuff that she had to deal with in her foreign language class in particular was astounding to me. And she was very frustrated because it was a very hostile environment for someone who did not believe the same way that the professor believed. And, you know, I thought we were just sending her for a foreign language class. So be aware, and especially as you get into the humanities, there's going to be tons of that. Also in science, you know, you're going to, you're going to see a very different worldview. So just be fully aware and communicating that with your students before you make those choices. And then another consideration, just a very practical one, will the courses be accepted at the future college where my student chooses to attend? So if you're going to a college that is regionally accredited, that is kind of the gold standard of accreditation for colleges, most of the time, those courses will transfer. That is not necessarily true at um, more elite colleges or those who are really restrictive in what they will take. It is also not necessarily true anytime there's a really rigorous program. So for instance, my youngest son knew that he wanted his top choice school um, was very selective about what dual enrollment they would take. They wouldn't take a lot of things from a local community college or from other colleges, even if they were regionally accredited. So he did dual enrollment with that one school that was the most selective. And he knew that they would take their own dual enrollment, of course, but he also knew that the other colleges on his list would take from that college. And so he just went, you know, he did most of his dual enrollment through them. And that way he knew it would be accepted. So that worked out really well for him, but just go in eyes wide open. Um, I believe I talked to Rhodes College, which is here in Tennessee. If you use it for high school credit, you cannot use it for college credit at the same time. And so that's one of their standards. Basically, they don't honor any dual credit courses at Rhodes. And so some of the more selective schools are going to have a different standard, and you just need to know that going in. Um, and then the other question I think we must ask is, is it valuable to skip these classes when they go to college, right? There's, there's a couple of different considerations here. Yeah, we can expedite things, maybe save some money if they're not there as long, but is that beneficial for them? So that falls into a few different categories, I think. For one, I've seen a lot of people getting their associate's degree before they graduate high school. Well, that seems great. They've already finished two years of college. Is your student really ready to walk into upper level division classes in their major right off the bat? Uh, if they've done community college and now they're going to a four-year university, there may be a difference in the level of difficulty of those classes. And they're jumping into upper level classes, which are far more challenging and they often have a much higher uh, workload. So is that gonna be beneficial? Socially, is it gonna be beneficial for them to be the new person on campus that is chronologically a freshman, but they are actually a junior in all their classes. And so all of their classes are with people that are two to three years older than them. And it can be hard to integrate into that freshman community if they are jumping into only having classes with juniors and seniors. So those are some things to keep in mind as you are considering this. The other piece that's just near and dear to my heart, we have a real preference for liberal arts and humanities. And, you know, as a core, I have one really good STEM kid, you know, like he just loves those sciences, but he values the humanities and liberal arts too. We wanted to make sure that they were still in a robust discussion, a place where they could have these great classes that were, that were rich and holistic. And so if, if we did all of those during high school, he would have jumped straight into classes where he was missing out on some of this with his peers too, because they leave those classes and they're still talking about it when they go to lunch and they're discussing these big ideas. And if he would have gone straight into only major classes, that would have been um, a little different consideration. So one other thing that I'll say about dual credit, and I forgot to include this on the slide, that um, if you are going for a very specific major or degree, it can affect what will be accepted. So engineering is one of the first ones that comes to mind with this. Just because you've taken a class at a community college and you've, maybe your student has already done calculus one and two, if they are transferring into an engineering program, a lot of times they will require them to repeat it because they wanna make sure that they really have that basis that they need for um, 
in all their math before they go into engineering. And so that there are things that they say online, like, oh yeah, we give you credit for these classes, but your particular program or major may not. Um, and that's especially true in the hard sciences. So I would say, just ask those questions going in. I don't think it hurts. Like I ran out of science and math that I could teach my kid at home. You know, we were kind of out of those on my STEM kid. And even if he wouldn't have gotten credit when he transferred to college, he still would have had that background and he would have still had the more rigorous math and science course. And it would have cost me about the same as it did to send him, you know, to, to an AP calculus class with a different organization. So, you know, that that's not to say don't do it. That's just to say, don't plan on it always replacing everything. Okay, the other option for earning credit in high school is usually credit by testing. Uh, there's the two most common forms of these are AP and CLIP. The students will only get credit for these though if they receive a qualifying score on that exam. And that qualifying score is set by the college or university. It is not set by the test company. AP is more rigorous than CLEP. A lot of times it takes two years of a course, uh, a high school course to, to be able to take the AP test. You know, it's it's considered a more thorough exam. CLEP is often a one, you know, a one year course. Then the other thing to know is that AP exams are given during a two week period each spring. So if you are taking the AP American history exam, then, or I think it's called the US history, then you, they will set it is given at 8 a.m. on this date. And, you know, it'll either be the morning or the afternoon. So uh, college board actually sets all of those dates and times. You do not have options to flex from those. That is the only time you may take that test. You also must test at a local school. And this was the hardest thing that I encountered in doing any AP testing with my students. They um, getting the local school to respond to me, to tell me whether they offered that particular exam and whether they would register my student or not, because it is up to the school to do that. And so this is a lengthy process. You have to know going in that it exists and you have to register in the fall. The tests are given in May, but I believe the cutoff is usually in November. It's like October or November when you have to order everything. So it's not like, let's see how the class goes and then we'll determine whether or not we're gonna take the exam. You're registering in the fall to take the exam in May. I, I did actually have to go stand in the office of one particular high school before they would ever respond to me <laughs> as to whether or not they could, I just took my checkbook and I, I, I didn't leave until I talked to someone that agreed to let me send test to the school. But um, yeah, we've had a lot of unreturned phone calls in this process. Some schools are better about it than others. You just have to get to the right person, but just know that this is the process that you're gonna go through. CLEP exams tend to be a lot more flexible. They are usually given at a testing center. A, a community college will often have a proctored testing center where these are given. They can be scheduled throughout the year. There are some boundaries on that, of course, but those are things that you can pursue um, that, that may be a little more flexible for you. Again, you must check with colleges to see if they will be accepted. Not everything is accepted. Um, and they may say, hey, we'll take some club tests, but here's the list, or some AP tests, but here's the list, and here's the score you must get. So just be aware that this is what you're doing. It is not a given that if your kid takes the test and passes it, you know, with whatever number that they will get credit for it. Furthermore, I will say we did this with my oldest son because his college of choice preferred AP testing over dual enrollment. So we did some AP tests with him. Um, but my daughter is a very different style learner. And she also just did not like the pressure of I'm gonna be given one massive long test and whether or not I get credit for the course depends on this one test. And so for her, it just wasn't worth it because it would have stressed her out more. So she opted for more dual enrollment because that was she was really good at managing the workload day by day and she performed well on tests, but it was more stress than she wanted to take on. And so just knowing my kid that way I, we didn't plan for credit by testing with her because it was more stressful than she needed it to be. 